Great. Well, today I've got the brains, I've got the brawn, and I've sure got bravery on my hands because this man is taking on the fitness industry and his name's Dr. John Jackwish. I've been watching him on Instagram for a while. Go and have a look. The man is chiseled. The man has sure size and he's got a story to tell because I've been reading his book, Weightlifting is a Waste of Time. So is cardio and there's a better way to get the body you want. An incredible read that is breaking these uh, weightlifting dogmas and gym dogmas and barbell dogmas that have been around there for so long. What I've loved mostly is it's a science book. This man has a PhD. We're not only talking about a body, we're talking about serious brain power. So welcome to the show, Dr. John Jackwish. Thanks for having me, Steve. This is, uh, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us your story, what happened to your mom and osteoporosis and how you got into the, you know, the fitness industry as well as just developing some serious bone strength in the people that are battling with osteoporosis. Well, uh, I, I ne I, I've never been a part of the fitness industry. I'm uh, apparently a disruptor of the fitness industry, but yeah, I don't really see an industry at all. I see a lot of confused people making things that people might buy, uh, but they don't know what they're doing. Uh, so the, um, when, it, when it came to osteo osteoporosis, my mother, she was diagnosed with osteoporosis. She was in a panic. She thought she was too young. She thought... It was going to limit her quality of life, and it does. So uh, what I did was I said, let me, let me look for the people with the highest levels of bone mass in the world and see how they did it, and maybe I'll come up with some way to have that help you. Because she just didn't want to take the medications. Yeah. Pretty brutal side effects. So you, you have them all in South Africa, so you know. Uh, <clears throat> we, um, what I did was... It was very obvious which athletes, wh who were the super responders, and it was gymnasts. And it was because of the rate at which they hit the ground. It was impact. Impact was the influence in their bone mass. So I thought, okay, what if I could create a device or a series of devices that could give the benefit of impact without the risks of impact, right? So. Uh, I did that, tested it with my mother, and within 18 months, she had the bones of a 30-year-old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. And she was in her 70s wow. at the time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, now she has, like, super young bone, and she goes and does everything, hiking, gardening, anything. Great. And this is the product yeah. that you developed called OsteoStrong. It uh, looks yeah. like a set of sort of biomedical machines that put forces through different parts of the body to ensure that the yeah. correct load, I think it's 4.2, is that correct? Uh, a load. It's, at it, yeah. it's different in different places yeah. in the body. But yeah, uh, they're robotic musculoskeletal treatment mm -hmm. devices. They all have a robotic arm to get the positioning exact. Uh, and then they, they're uh, also cloud-based, so they record all the data and analyze it with all the other data of the hundreds of thousands of users. So, you know, like already we have some of the largest collection of bone loading data ever, and, uh, and it's growing, you know. So there's a lot of research and science to this. I mean, you've spoken to, you know, a lot of specialist physicians about the, the benefits of OsteoStrong outweighing you know, all the classic medications and drips and, you know, calcium sort of supplements they're giving and vitamin D supplements. You've seen a significant uptake in all the science and the research that you put together. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, it, the good news about medicine <clears throat> is if you show the evidence. Now, the level of acceptable evidence in with, with medicine is like a lot higher than, than yeah. fitness. Yeah. Uh, you know, fitness studies are done all the time with 12 people, mm. pretty much the minimum amount if you get a, a, you know, to get statistical significance. So you have the proper confidence interval in your statistics, but mm. like that kind of study in medicine is like yeah. garbage. Yeah. Like that's a pilot study. That's like, should we do a real study? <laughs> that's the only question that answers. So, mm -hmm. um, I collected data that wasn't like pharma level, but it was good. 
and uh, and you know, I ran ran a couple of studies, and the good news is, at first, the medical professionals were uninterested because they were like, "Well, until you do a trial with ten thousand, you know, spend ten thousand people millions of dollars, we're not even going to bother read this." But I kept showing up to the conferences, and I kept being a speaker. And uh, like, like also like a lot of these institutions that are su supposedly owned by pharma, they're not, mm. they want to help people. Like the International Osteoporosis Foundation was awesome. They kept inviting me back. Okay. They really wanted to hear what I was doing. And uh, so, you know, they, they, I, the lectures got bigger every year that I went to their uh, annual Congress. And uh, it, it ended up just working out. And, and the good news is about medical professionals, if you've shown the evidence, even if it's at a lower level than they're used to seeing, they still understand. Okay. And so, yeah, like, and it was just one after the other, like, wow, I will prescribe this. I will right. send patients. And you know, ultimately it's a, it's a treatment with no side effects. Uh, with very little risk and uh, risk of injury, and and um, it's it's an alternative to where you can have a non pharmaceutical approach. Then you try that first. Yeah. And of course, you know, for it, it does require effort out of people. You have to try hard. So some people, for one reason or another, you know, maybe they have some joint pain, or they just have a low tolerance for discomfort, or they just don't really want to try. You know, yeah. they'd rather just take a pill and, you know, maybe have a side effect. They don't yeah. care. So, and for those people, the medications, they're, they're going to have to do their job because there's, they're, they're unwilling to or unable to participate with osteostrome. But the vast majority of people respond very well yeah. to the osteostrome therapy. So, uh, yeah, like I said, hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Yeah, well done. Incredible. Of uh, 300 clinics, you said, in eight countries. Is that correct? 140 clinics in okay. eight different countries. Okay, great. Yeah. Excellent. And then what moved you towards the X3, something that I've been using for six months that uh, I'm so grateful that I've had in lockdown. We had a really hard lockdown in SA. At times, you know, you weren't even allowed to walk into the street. So it was, it was really tough, but I had probably one of the best, well, I think the best exercise equipment uh, possible known as the X3. What moved you there and how did you get into it? I agree with you. That is the best exercise option. Uh, it, it, it came out of the similar science to the bone density equipment. When I realized just how powerful humans are in the impact ready range of motion, I knew weightlifting was a waste of time because we're so much more capable in these impact ready ranges, but we always select a weight that we can use through an entire range of motion and full range of motion exercise definitely has merit. Like there's a reason we've been doing that. But in the whole spectrum, that just like just looking at weightlifting, you know, holding one weight here and the same weight here and the same weight here, you know, going through the whole range yeah. of motion makes no sense if you're seven times more powerful in the impact ready range of motion than you are in the weaker range of motion. So we need a weight that changes as we move. So I was already busy with uh with osteo strong yeah. so I, I i did not want to launch another thing and so i was going to write a book about band training and just say everybody should be using bands but then as i started looking at some heavier band because the bands that, that are out there like i get stupid people all the time they're like oh your thing is just bands and i can get bands for five dollars at walmart yeah and they will provide five pounds of resistance yeah. the x3 in a deadlift format for example, gives me over 600 pounds of force. So, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, I mean, you get what you pay for. Like you can buy a, a you know, an old rubber tire for 10 bucks, or you can buy a car for 20,000. Yeah. There's a big difference. They're not the same. So, uh, yeah, I just, um, I realized that once the bands got heavy enough, using them on their own, like throwing one around your back and doing a push up. The problem is your wrists are getting twisted. You get it heavy enough, you could break your own wrist. So like 
the either neural inhibitory process will stop you or you'll actually cause an injury which i know plenty of people who uh thought they were smart and were not and uh just went and they saw the x3 and they're like well i'll just use bands by themselves and they got all screwed up yeah yeah okay. so Great. well tell me a bit more about variable resistance because i think you know i've got the x3 behind me here and i mean the bar is incredible i mean it's just it's a proper i think olympic bar you said and just explain to people when all the movements like this is the inner range you you really are weak there and i think in different sort of motions the deadlift or whether you're doing the shoulder press uh, i know that the 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 row is different i think your strongest range is at a different range but in your mid range you're quite strong in the press you're in strongest just before you lock out and the band right. actually increases in force depending on the different range is that correct dramatically yes dramatically okay. yeah and we we had to make special bands that would would you know give deliver the right amount of force uh because they didn't exist okay so i mean like i said hundreds of pounds when i do a chest press i hold 540 pounds at the top 300 pounds in the middle and uh, about 100 pounds at the bottom okay. and then yeah i go to fatigue with that 540 pounds and i'm devastated just exhausted mm -hmm. and then i do repetitions with the middle range until i exhaust there and then my last few repetitions are maybe only an inch Okay. You know, because I'm exhausting the weakest range of motion. And that's why I have complete exhaustion of the muscle, complete evacuation of ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate, which you cannot do with a weight, complete exhaustion of the myofibril system, which you cannot do with a weight, and perfect hypoxia by not locking out, which you also cannot do with a weight, uh, which then downregulates myostat and changes your genetic potential. So like three massive yeah. approaches to very aggressive growth all at once. Yeah, incredible. And I mean, uh, in your book said you were a scrawny kid, which I, I battle to believe. I mean, I think you were sitting at 160 pounds. Is, is that a true story? You try to play rugby at 160 pounds and then you grew and you were very lanky. I mean, is this a story yeah. of someone who's put on some serious muscle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should have put some more pictures of me younger because everybody they look at me and they're like, wow, you, know, you were like probably a monster, you know, like in high school. And I was, I was too small to play football. They wouldn't let me play football. So I wrestled, okay. which is actually a lot better conditioning. Yeah. Wrestlers are tough as nails. Yeah. Like a, a wrestler is so much tougher than a football player. <laughs> yeah. Uh, American wrestling is awesome. Uh, and I like how mixed martial arts has shown us that the ultimate martial art is American wrestling. Um, <laughs> okay. I, I love saying that to MMA people that are like from Brazil I and, mean, yeah. you know, they want to say Brazilian Jiu Jitsu is like, I'm like, no. Yeah. No. no. But I mean, you made a very controversial statement. Weightlifting is a waste of time. I mean, you can go to the gym. The guys are still really big. They're put on serious size. Is that a combination of some roids? Is that a combination that you do put size on, but you damage yourself in the process? Or when you're 16, you've got so much growth hormone, or 25, you don't damage the joints. But when you're 45, you try and lift those weights at the different ranges, you're going to cause some serious strain and pressure on the enthesis, on the joint capsule, on the joint mm -hmm. itself, on the tendons. So you can get away with it when you're 25, possibly, but not when you're 40. Is that correct? um close when you're younger you're weaker so it's like it's not the same stress on the joint the stronger you become the more stress on the joint because the joint does not grow in proportion uh to the power in the body if you're training with a static weight <laughs> um it does with with uh with my approach but uh you know you're you're there's, there's so many things wrong with like when you're younger it, it, it's just you have softer joints so yes there's an age advantage there you have more growth factors in the body and you're really lifting lighter weight so like it's not as hard on the joints and they're not stopping you you know the pain isn't keeping you from continuing your sets so that's why teenagers they get, get a little bit of muscle growth 
But you said something interesting. What about all the guys in the gym that are all muscular? And my answer to that, and Dr. Baker loves it when I talk about this, where are they? They don't, they barely exist. Like who is really like in a totally awesome shape? Who, who gets confused for a professional athlete who is just a guy who goes to the gym? Almost nobody. So there's people who are kicking and screaming, you know, about the title of my book, who of course didn't read it. I mean, I don't even know if they can read it. Uh, it's, it's written at a high school, it's written at a high school reading level. Yeah. Uh, so I, 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 I look at these people that are just throwing a tantrum and I click on their picture and they have a, you know, they're, some of them look like they're in high school and they haven't hit puberty yet. So I don't know why they think they have all the answers because they clearly haven't got any results yet. I mean, maybe they will, but I think they just believe in the guys who have been doing it the way it's been done for a long time. And, you know, okay, well, you know, you used to walk into a hospital and they would take down your fever by covering you with leeches. Yeah. They don't do that anymore. There's yeah. better ways. We have a sedimentifin. Does a much better job. Also well, way less chance. Yeah. Of yeah, I mean, I mean, I think you're a pioneer, you're a disruptor too. That's why I said the fitness industry, I think you're going to change people in terms of way exercise. And we've got a huge nutritional disruptor here, Prof Noakes, that I've had on the podcast. And, you know, he's had the oh, same resistance. Prof Jim Noakes is like one of my favorite people in the world. Like, what, what an awesome guy. Yeah. And so I think that's the resistance you're going to get, for, uh, pardon the pun, in terms of trying to come up against these great weightlifters and, you know, doing CrossFit and, you know, all these CrossFit boxes and what's happening. What I see, because, you know, I've done a lot of prolotherapy and a lot of treatments over the time, is that these, you know, these people damage the joints, the ligaments, the tendons, the discs. They're putting so much pressure on their white tissue. That's almost all I see is just like, I just watch, you know, okay, like that guy, I'll, he'll need a shoulder replacement. Yeah. You know, just, I can just see, I can see them wince in pain when they get into the weaker range of motion, this chronic traumatic injury happening to those joints. And like, it's what, what's it for? I mean, okay. So you're a CrossFit competitor. Yeah. All right. But, but the way you've been training is just trashing your joints these people aren't going to be able to like just raise their arm up yeah. like this. They, they, they won't be able to have a full range of motion yeah. in you know, a year or two. Yeah. So th then what's your training going to look like? It's going to look like nothing because it'll be yeah. nothing because you can't move. Yeah. So what's the point of that? I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Now just tell me, I think what's really important in my mind with the X3 is that over the last six months, I've put on about uh, three and a half kilograms of lean muscle mass which has been good, good for me. My story is uh, 25 years of uh, running. I'm an ultra endurance runner, 35,000 kilometers I've run in the last 25 years. I love the sport. I love the way it makes me feel. I get a runner's high. I did start realizing a few years ago that, and I was always in the gym once or twice a week. I've been training since the age of four. When it was on the sports field or it was running. Uh, I just love my sports. I love my training. I try to keep pretty strong with a bit of Pilates, a bit of core, and a bit of gym work. But I wasn't. Uh, my, my results were starting to to decrease. I was starting to get a few more injuries, a few more niggles, and I realized I had to do far more strength work. So I find out uh, about the X3 through Ben Greenfield and, and the work that he was doing as a biohacker. I got it, I started using it, and uh, even with me running three times a week, because I love my cardio, and using the X3 probably three, four times a week, I've managed to put that muscle mass on. My body fat percentage has gone down to probably about nine and a half, ten percent 10%, which has been incredible for me. And I put some, you know, some real size on, and I put some size on areas that I thought I would never, like the middle deltoid, my shoulders have increased, but there's no exercise that actually you do, like a lateral raise, of with the X3, but somehow you get a development in muscles that you're not actually functionally moving by doing these set of exercises. So can you take us through the number of exercises? I know the sheet here that I've got here, it's of you. It's eight exercises. I think there's a couple more that have been in the Facebook group, like the upright row, the split squat and that. But take us through the series of exercises. Does it really take 10 minutes? And uh, if you do go to full fatigue, will you actually 
hypertrophy the muscle? Will you grow the muscle or will you just increase in strength? Which question do you want me to answer? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, there's eight main exercises and there's a couple of supplementary ones. But be careful. You want to follow the real program because there's a lot of, like, just clown stuff that people make up. And they don't really understand biomechanics and they don't understand the principles that we're trying to apply. So just follow the program and don't listen to anybody else. Okay. Uh, not that they're all wrong, but if, if we come across something smart, we'll put it in the program. And that has happened never. Uh, so, you know. Uh, the eight exercises, I mean, you do them, do you do push day, you know, you do uh, uh, bench or press. Uh, you do uh, chest press. So also, like, there's some things you can leave out if you don't want to do specific uh, kind of hypertrophy work. So, you know, the, the, the most efficient movements are the multi-joint movements, chest press, squats, deadlift, overhead press. Uh, and then there's some single joint movements like calf raises. Now, like, you know, we're, we're training athletes. Like, like I work with, uh, 10 NFL players. I work with an entire, uh, NBA team in the in basketball team in, in the States and then a bunch of different, uh, bas NBA basketball players. Uh, it's different. Like, like they have they don't do, they're not going to do specific calf work. They're going to engage their calves. They're going to try and engage their calves more uh, in the deadlift a little bit because that's, that's more full body. You know, when they do a jump shot, it's not just the calves are driving that. Yeah. It's the whole body. It's the momentum. It's the swinging of the arms. It's um, the momentum moving forward and they can leverage that. <clears throat> so, uh, and also I'm not a basketball coach. So I work with those coaches to activate as much as possible the things that they need so they can get more, you know, more vertical and then be more protected when they land. Okay. Because that's when injuries happen, especially if they get knocked off balance as they're in the air, which yeah. happens all the time. And those guys, because they're so tall, they're at greater risk of joint injury at all times. Yeah. Uh, tall people, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, there's more leverage on, on every joint. And so, you know, the joints are just built like everybody else's. They don't have super joints. Yeah. So, yeah. So all those things go together. Um, now the main move, so the, the main movements and the specific movements, you know, like Ben Greenfield had me on his podcast and he says like, you know, like calf raises, like, why would you do that? And I'm like, Cause I like girls complimenting my calves, <laughs> you know, like it looks like somebody glued two ribeye steaks on the back of my lower legs. It looks awesome. Mm. And he's like, wow, like I was really going to make fun of you for this, but like, that's a pretty good answer. <laughs> like he really, he was like, I was so excited to like say like, oh yeah, I mean, oh. Uh, calves specific. I just want good looking calves. Yeah. Like it's community. There's no, there's no functional reason. Mm. Uh, yeah. I just want to look dynamite, and they do. Okay. So, uh, and if you go to full fatigue, you know, I mean, it's probably if I'm tired mentally or I had a tough work day or a tough night uh, with my four year old, you know, the X3 is probably one of the hardest workouts it, that I've ever yeah. done. And yeah, I'm much more exhausting than a weight workout. Much yeah, more. and I'm finished. And so, you know, with neural inhibition and the central governor theory of Tim Noakes, that it's actually your mind you know, that uh, governs how hard you can push to a large degree. These workouts are really tough. So to get the muscle to grow in size, not only in strength, you need to go to full fatigue or what other people call full failure. You need to make sure that you go through the different ranges in full fatigue. So if you're doing that chest press, then you, you push it out when you can't hold it anymore, then you push it in the mid range and then you push it yeah. in the inner range until you totally, yeah. totally fatigue. And that's right. what causes the growth. Is that correct? And the hormonal release as well. That's right. That's right. You know, the, the hormones have uh, the, two, the two biggest growth factors that, that have a lot of research behind them are testosterone and growth hormone. Uh, growth hormone 
its axis is really uh, the stabilization firing. So balancing yourself, which a lot of different, you know, exercises, I, I see people like, you know, using machines and stuff. This is why performance athletes use barbells. Uh, they don't really use many machines at all, if any, uh, because you lose the stabilization firing. You just, you don't respond the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, like um, when you look at what, uh, there was one one of the references in a meta-analysis that uh, my co-author uh, of you know, the book, Henry and I, um, we, we did a meta-analysis in 2016 of stabilization firing interventions and in growth hormone. And like you look at uh, a, a regular squat and you're holding maybe one third or one half of the weight that somebody does in a leg press. Now, of course, the leg press is kind of silly because most of the weight is being driven into the ground because you're pushing at an angle. But these sideways had dummies don't know that. So they think it's more weight yeah. and they think it's better. And uh, so what, what was shown is that the uh, people doing the regular free weight squat could increase their growth hormone by 600% after just one set from self-stabilization with a heavy weight. Now, the, the stronger, more strategic interventions than a squat uh, yielded over 2,000%. You know how much the leg, leg press did? How much? Zero. Nothing. Wow. Right. So it's like trying to get a tan with candles. It's just not how your body works. Yeah. You can try all you want. Yeah, it's not people common like, knowledge, this, you know, the people don't know that. And this is what they're doing in the gym, you know, and I think that's what you're trying yeah. to really say. You know, like, I mean, I, like my, my, my greatest analogy is if, if, if regular weight training is so great, where are all the fit people? Why doesn't everybody look like a professional athlete? Everybody, everybody looks like nothing to yeah. me. Like you go in the average gym, I'm not talking about Venice Beach, yeah. Golds, where all the pros, you know, pro bodybuilders train. Mm -hmm. You go in the average gym like in the states it's equinox uh you know whatever in germany it's mrs sporty i don't know what's big in south africa <clears throat> but um you walk in there and the people don't look like they work out and some of them been working out for years yeah. Yeah. so why would you defend an industry that is an absolute failure yeah. like people get nothing and like you know, some of the some of the defenders of of this is like, well, you know, you you need to get your hormones right. You know, they're just taking anabolics, and it's like, okay, you don't need that. Yeah, your body will make those things mm. you, if yeah. you give it the reason. So that brings me to t testosterone. That was a long trail back to testosterone. Uh, so when it comes to testosterone, the amount of heavy that's applied. Like you cannot get away from heavy if you want a muscle to grow. You got to put huge forces through the body. Well, when somebody uses X3, they're using far greater forces than they would ever be able to use in a gym. And they're using it at high repetition. So like, like my chest press is like 20, 22, 23, 28 mm. repetitions with, uh, with over 500 pounds. And I get the benefit of that with the myofibril exhaustion. And then I focus on sarcoplasmic exhaustion. Uh, there's no stimulus like that. Nowhere. And, and, we, and we get the growth. And we have people emailing us before and after pictures. And they're, they're all over the website. Um, where they put on more than, than 20 pounds of muscle in six months. They put on muscle faster than I did. Wow. And, uh, and, you know, this is like, we see this all the time with people who use it right. Now there's also people who get it and then they just, you know, only eat half the protein they need. If your body doesn't have the building blocks, well. That's not going to do it. Right, right. So, so, just, so uh, it, yeah, go through. Go ahead. No, I just expand on the fact, you know, I mean, a lot of rehab, if we take like lateral rotation to strengthen the rotator cuff or doing raises out to the side, being functional in this space, you know, a lot of people will get injuries, rotator cuff injuries, re reaching behind to get something in the car. You know, these, these functional movements, you know, that aren't with X3 front raises or, you know, these type of movements, uh, 
you know, using your, your glute medius to go out laterally and abduct the hip. You know, a lot of strength work is done to rehab athletes in that space. Does X3 sort of incorporate and strengthen sort of your, delt, your mid-deltoid, your glute medius, and your, your lateral rotators? It did. It does. And the, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of myth in like what's functional and also like ultimately and uh, Ben Pakulski and I were driving together and he's a former Mr. Olympia competitor. And he said, you know, the problem with the word functional is the function of a muscle is to shorten. So you can call anything functional because yeah. muscles, anything, any movement, and you know ultimately if you have something heavy to pick up you don't grab it and then lift it laterally so that's not functional at all uh so yeah i mean i see people say that you know well you can't do a lateral raise with this yeah and who would want to okay. like that's a terrible exercise and it's damaging the shoulder uh you can't like i mean remember what i said about heavy and testosterone receptors you don't get a heavy weight through the deltoid by, by doing that. By doing this, you do. Okay. The overhead press. Now, if you can't, if you don't have the range of motion of the overhead press, then you do an upright row, which is, you know, that's got some limitations, but that's more for the people who just don't have the range of motion to lift their arm over their head. So, okay. For example, my father, he's had a couple of shoulder surgeries and. Yeah. Yeah, uh, a, lo a lot of years uh, being an engineer and experimenting with a lot of things. Uh, he designed and built a lunar rover, a uh, little car that's on the moon. Oh, wow. uh, so, you know, like engineering projects where they're working with the guys who are the constructors mm -hmm. building these, you know, the prototypes and they're pulling stuff and picking up stuff. And yeah, he, he beat up on himself yeah, a little sure. bit. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, that shoulder press, I mean, that's the one that I fear the most. I mean, if I'm not strong or if I'm not feeling solid, that thing absolutely decimates you. It takes everything out of you. And really, I mean, the X3, I've started doing it at the end of my workouts, you know. So, you know, I've realized if I go for a hard sprint, if I, you know, I want to do uh, some left, like some functional movement there with maybe a bit of blood flow restriction bands and, and cards you just to get out the workout and get the movement of the body. I'll, I'll finish my sets because once I've done X3, you know, I'm done. I, there's nothing more in me. So I, I have found personally just doing 10 minutes hasn't given me the endorphin release. And that's why I've incorporated a bit of sprinting. I've incorporated it with a bit of blood flow restriction bands. Is that the right protocol to put X3 at the end and just finish totally to full fatigue? If we weren't on a podcast, I would give you probably a different answer. Uh, you know, like you understand your body, you've been an athlete a long time, you're advanced. Um, about 99% of the people who are going to hear this podcast are going to think they're advanced athletes. Everybody, everybody wa wants to think that they're, you know, expert. Level. Yeah. Right. Um, I would say to 99% of the people who follow the program. Okay. Because you don't know better. You're not in, in tune with your body. You're not just because you've been going to a gym uh, doesn't mean you've accomplished anything. It doesn't mean you have years of experience. You probably have one day of experience and you've repeated that one day of experience for yeah. years. And, uh, and oh, look, you look the same as day one. So, uh, yeah, it, it's... Uh, I. I I don't want people messing with the program because as okay. soon as they do, they don't get the results because they don't understand yeah. the, the principles behind it. So I would say, and I mean, I would say this to you too, like the best results are going to be if you follow the program. Okay. Got so the right. letter, but you know, you're, you're used to uh, endorphin yeah. effect. And so, you, you know, you, you're looking for something a little different. Yeah. Now, like, katsu's cool, but you're getting a better hypoxic effect with just a regular X3 set because if you don't lock out and you don't rest at the bottom, the muscle does hypoxia anyway. Yeah. The problem with the tourniquets is the tourniquets, like your body knows that there's a tourniquet there. Mm. And, and there's a lot of neural inhibition, which is why you have to go so light. Mm. 
when you use katsu is because most of the muscle is shut off. So you're getting a weak effect anyway with the hypoxic okay. tension. You're going to get a better one if you just keep constant tension with X3. Yeah. Got you. So, Got you. Yeah. So it's a little redundant. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. Uh, right. And, uh, you yeah, know, I understand. Like you're, you're used to a longer workout where, where, you, where you do get that. And that, that is very time sensitive. Yeah. You, you do got to put in the time uh, to get that. And I'm glad you're not doing it with, uh, you know, ultra marathons, which are very damaging joints. Yeah. Yeah. It's joints and also the long term effects of the oxidative stress. So, you know, I've done yeah. less, you know, less marathons than I ever have. Dr. Noak said if you could turn the clock back, you would do less marathons. So obviously I've done a lot of aerobic. I love the feeling of, uh, you know, the endorphin rush. But as I'm getting old, I'm going to be doing more strength work, limiting the cardio. Let's move on to the, the second part of the book that says, so is cardio. Tell us what happens with cortisol, what happens with GH, when doing excessive cardio. People think it's the best way to lose weight. I have, I've been running for so many years. I started using X3 and I tell you, yeah, my back, my body fat percentage came down and my lean muscle mass went up with X3. Right. That, that was the bottom line. That's what's happened. Yeah. yeah, because your hormones were not working against you for the first time in your life. Because when you do steady state cardio, your cortisol goes up and stays up for a long time. And what does cortisol do? It gets rid of muscle and metabolizes muscle. And it, it encourages the storage of body fat and, and makes it so that you're not, it protects body fat. So you're going to stay fatter longer by doing cardiovascular exercise. Yeah. And there's 40 years of research here. Like people, like I, I say that, people act like I just like made it up. And part of the reason there's over 250 references in the book is because I wanted people to see it. Like here's all the studies. You can look any of these up. Yeah. And um, I mean, I still, I get trolls that are like, yeah, it's still alive. Like, okay, well, which study do you have a problem with? Yeah. They, they can't even read one of them mm. because they don't know how to read research. But you can certainly read the conclusion and the conclusions are pretty clear. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, also I feel like because of social media, it has highlighted a, a true failing of the human mind, which is people want the answer they want, not the answer. That's the truth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I like the story in your book where you're doing X3 and then you got on a bike and you started cycling and you went up a big peak and you managed to cycle well without even stopping. You weren't even training with regards that to cycling. That was Henry. That was Henry. Oh, that was Henry. Oh, that was Henry. But I mean, yeah, that was yeah. an incredible story because, uh, you know, I'm, I've run 11 Comrades Marathons. It's a 56-mile race that happens every single year. You know, it's the hardest ultra marathon, I think, in the world. Probably about 20,000 people that start that race. I love the race. I love the day. It takes me just mm -hmm. under – I've done 11 in a row now. So – yeah, I, you know, I generally finish top 15% of the field, including the pros. I just, I love the challenge and it's, uh, it's tough with the elevation. And, uh, but I'm just wondering if I do more X3 after reading that story, I thought if I get more X3 and less, do less mileage, you know, and be far stronger, there's a chance that I can get away with less miles on the road and more X3 and still be able to finish the race. Possible. Now keep in mind, Dragging extra muscle around is not going to make you a better ultra marathoner because uh, let me give you an example. Like there's a myth out there that strength athletes have poor cardiovascular. Yes. The reason, the, 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 re, the reason that this has been casually observed and inaccurately observed is because, and I'll give you an, an analogy here. Uh, this, this happened. This guy I was working with, and we were uh, changing planes in Munich, and we were headed to Moscow. And I'm 240, and he's like 140, like a really, really slight, slight guy. I'm talking pounds here. Uh, so, um, we, the Munich airport is like the. I don't, I don't know how the Germans did this. They do everything right except that airport. Uh, it, it's a mess. Like you're running up and down the stairs all the time. Like you got to go through 
uh, you know, the, the customs and you got to go through the passport check and you're just up and down, up and down, up and down. And so we're, we're having a, we're, our plane came in late and we had to get to our, uh, flight to Moscow and, uh, it was a different air group too. So they didn't know where we were coming from. Cause if it's the same air group, you know, the hold, the hold a plane. Uh, so, you know, like we're hustling and, uh, he's doing great. Now he, he does do quite a bit of cardiovascular exercise and I'm like, you know, out of breath and there's like sweat on my face and he's like, man, your cardiovascular health is terrible. And I said, no, that's not the problem. The problem is my quadriceps are four times bigger than yours are. And when I switch that engine on, it takes that much more blood. Yeah. So it's just a bigger engine. It's like, it's like, you know, it's a difference between a Prius and a Formula One car. A Prius is designed to go long distances uh, and be very fuel efficient. The Formula One car, not at all. Short distances, incredible speed and power. Yeah, I'm with you. So I'm the Formula One car. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm purpose built. That's, that's what strength training will do. I have very low body fat. He has, you know, like he's kind of skinny fat. Yeah. Got much higher body fat than I do, even though he's much smaller. Yeah. But he has very little musculature, yeah. which does you a favor if you're doing uh, great distance. So that's why I brought that up. Like the body is actually trying to get rid of muscle when you do steady state cardio because yeah. it's just extra weight. It's an extra, like you don't want a V12 engine if you're going to do an ultra marathon. Yeah. You want like a four cylinder, you want something tiny. Yeah, I got and you. So it's it's interesting, but you know, if you cross train with X three, uh, you will have a lot more speed and power in the harder parts. Yeah, great. I want to just uh, move on to DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness. Uh, I don't get much. I mean, when I've done the X three to full fatigue, and I tell you, that's a finishing workout. The next day, I can feel the muscle. There's not a lot of soreness. I mean, you you feel that you've worked it, but it's not like you can't lift your arm up. It's so painful. I mean, you just feel that the muscles work. Tell me about uh, sort of the lactic acid theory that has been disproven or delayed onset muscle soreness with the X3. Yeah, lactic acid is great, but you can't feel it. And it's a, it's a precursor to growth factors. Uh, it builds when you lift, but soreness is from damage. And there's also a myth out there that you like put micro tears in the muscle and then those tears grow back stronger. That is totally incorrect. That is a complete misread of human physiology and anyone's taken a physiology class knows this is not true. Uh, though it's said by bodybuilders and fitness gurus and sideways hat geniuses, uh on on youtube like every day yeah. uh it's just not how it works in fact muscle damage is inversely related to muscle growth so the more damage you have the more soreness you have the less you will grow not the more you will grow <laughs> so uh and that's part of the reason like like it loading the weaker range of motion is really where that damage comes from because the weaker range of motion can't handle it somebody who's really trying to push some some serious weight and their weaker range their joints can't handle it and so there's you know damage to the musculature the tendons and the ligaments and they're compounding that all the time and they think they're sore and oh, yeah, yeah, i had a hell of a workout awesome you know like no not really and you're not going to grow okay. i mean this is why 99 percent of the people or maybe maybe 99.9 percent .9 of the people you walk into a gym you can't even tell they work out they look like nothing so when you do the X3, you don't feel it much afterwards, you don't feel anything, or you just feel that, hang on, actually, I worked out the day before, you know, if you did chest or shoulders. I feel nothing, and I never have, and now I'm, I put on 60 pounds of muscle. Wow, wow. So, you know, that's more than most people would ever expect to put on in their life. Yeah. And that was a lot of few years. Great. So, Tell me about some yeah. of the safety. Have there been issues from a safety point of view, and also to keep – the constant tension, you've got to keep that constant tension. You can't let that tension go ever. You've got to make sure the muscles always engage and the bands always engage from a tension point of view. Tell us a little bit about any, you know, possible risks and that uh, with the band. Um, so the bands don't break. They fray like a rope. They're made out of layers of latex. 
So they'll come unraveled before they'll break. Okay. So some people like just lie and say like, oh, the band broke and like hit me in the face. And you know, I'm, you know, I'm in the hospital. Like, yeah. it's just some troll, just making some shit up. Uh, and we, we got a lot, a lot of those. Uh, but yeah, it's a, that's just not how it works. Um, it's like it's like in the in the eighties when you'd watch like an action movie, like a car would like drive off the road and then explode. Yeah, cars it don't do that. Yeah. yeah, you can you can go to a, you can go to a thousand car crashes and maybe there'll be a fire at like a one. Yeah, but in eighties action movies, car crash equals giant explosion. Yeah. yeah, right. Well, my favorite is sometimes the cars explode before they drive off the road because. The guy, the pyrotechnic guy packed the dynamite in there and he didn't time it right. Yeah. Uh, right, right. So it's uh, like, that, that's that's just, you know, there's been no injuries because of broken okay. bands. Except no for injuries. Two. Yeah. And little light sort of females, my wife's like very, you know, like five, five foot two. They manage with a white band. The, you know, my son's 16. He's starting to use the band. He's seen some muscle growth. I mean, is this for also, is this for everybody? Is, is this for the aged? Is this for, you know, youngsters? Can anybody use this? It's not going to stunt a person's growth if they start at the age of 12. You know, you know, a 52-year-old woman who's got, you know, who's tiny, can she use the white band? I use it with people in their 90s, you know. Now, they have to be mindful of their joint health and how they're starting off. Yeah. Because I've never met a 90-year-old who had perfect doings. Yeah, like they got one thing or another. So uh, yeah, I mean they can they can they can do it, and they can receive progress from it. Um, you know, when they take their shirt off, they're not going to look twenty. They're going to be ninety, but they'll look better. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, it, it, I designed it. I designed it so that the regular guy, who can experience the failures of the fitness industry like I, you know I, I never targeted bodybuilders that's why you know I, i'm so, so dumb when these guys get upset and it's just like i didn't want you as a customer anyway like i'm going after busy professional people mm. uh who know they, they they're old enough they're you know maybe in their mid-20s they're old enough to know that they tried lifting for a long time and they followed all the advice of all these you know, gurus and, 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 uh, and guys who are into bodybuilding, it's like, yeah, but it didn't work. Yeah. So, you know, the idea that weightlifting is a waste of time, they're like, maybe it is. It certainly didn't work for me. Yeah. And that's like everybody. And that, that's why this is now a, a Wall Street Journal bestseller and a USA Today bestseller. Uh, the New York Times bestselling list actually has nothing to do with book sales. They just pick I didn't know this. Uh, yeah, yeah, nothing to do with that. Okay. They just pick book that they think should sell the best. Wow. Uh, and usually it has to do with whatever issue is like popular on the day. Yeah. Like social or whatever. Um, which is fine. Uh, but like the Wall Street Journalist, why did I make the Wall Street Journalist? Well, because Wall Street Journal readers, they have X3s. Yeah. They've been, they've been following for a while and they're like, everything this guy is saying makes sense. Anybody who bothers to actually absorb even a little bit of the science mm. goes, wait a minute. Like, yes, it's different than everything I've heard, but it makes perfect sense. Mm. Right. So, so it's a right. safe device. I mean, it's pretty safe. You haven't had major injuries or major risk factors. How long will the device last? How long will the bands last? If someone buys it, is it going to last 10 years? I mean, what are your thoughts there? The bands won't be pretty for very long. It's like tires on a car. Yeah. You know, like, I don't care how nice the car is. The tires on my Lamborghini when I drove, you know, 500 miles, they, they didn't look good. They're not new anymore. They'll still go another 15,000 miles. Mm. Okay. I mean, a normal car would go 50,000 miles, but, you yeah, know, not that one. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, they'll it, – it's um, – it's soft material, so they get a little ratty looking. The logos wear off. Mm. Uh, not that big of a deal. Uh, okay. How long will the bands last? Usually in, in a commercial setting, layered latex will last nine years. Okay. 
Correct. So in a home setting, I would expect more. Now, I mean, if you leave it in the sunlight, if you leave them outside, yeah, that's mm -hmm. going to degrade them very fast. So cause the oils inside to volatilize mm -hmm. and uh, they can dry out. And, you know, but if you keep them indoors and, you know, mm -hmm. in a drawer or something, they'll be fine. Great. I love the fact that you can take it anywhere. I love the fact that you can do it outside, out in the sunlight. It's an incredible product, very versatile. When you, when you travel with it, do you put it in your checked-in bag or do you take it on hand like these? Are you allowed that Olympic bar on the plane? <laughs> no, I, I, I check it. You check like, it. I know it's like a 50-50 thing. Usually, yeah. the person working airport security recognizes it. They'll be like, oh, it's X3. And they just let, you know, let it yeah. go through. But, uh, you know, I just... You just, I just like I, I go on long trips and I travel international yeah. a lot. So oh, yeah. Yeah, just in the bag. All right, let's move on to nutrition, the carnivore diet, how much protein you need. Dr. Gabriel Lyons is just now on every single podcast talking about how important protein is and having a muscle centric longevity approach. How important muscle is for longevity. You know, I thought of you making that comment about your calves. I've got to get my calves bigger because the more muscle you've got, the more healthy and longer you're going to live. And that's the research that she's been doing on protein, on having a muscle-centric approach. So tell me about the carnivore, your one meal a day that you've been doing fasting, the myths around fasting and so forth. Well, the forerunner to the chapter on nutrition in the book, I say the two greatest drivers of long life are high levels of strength and low levels of body fat. So she's absolutely right. Like, and the research is very clear on this. There's no conflicting research on, on, like every other, you know, part of nutrition research has conflicting research, but you know, like when somebody says like carbohydrates have value, you know, whatever. Um, okay, well, no, they don't because we can demonstrate that it's the, it, it's the protein synthesis is needed. And when you look at the amount of protein, now I'm not 100% anti-carbohydrates. There's a strategic way to apply carbohydrates, but as far as like cellular function and what your body needs, they're never necessary. There's just a way yeah. to use them. You know, when you're on your runs, you use carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no way you can avoid it. You're, yeah. you're laying on the side of the road and you know, uh, but that doesn't mean it's because of the nutrition. It's because of the immediately available energy, yeah. which is not nutrition. So um, when I realized how much protein it takes to induce muscle growth, especially high levels of muscle growth, and when I compared that with the time-restricted eating that I really wanted to get done. If you com combine those two, it's like there's just no room in the human intestines for really anything else. And uh, I thought, okay, well, I mean, it certainly reconciles with all the ketogenic mm. work I've read, you know, Professor Noakes, like all his work and, and, uh, and books and lectures. And, uh, you know, it all started coming together. Like, mm. okay. We should be doing time restricted eating. If we're ketogenic, we won't go crazy, but you know, by doing that, only carb addicted people go crazy. Uh, you know, like I was uh, out with a special lady friend last night, and she was like, "Oh, like by eleven o'clock, like I just I have to eat something." And you know, I'm just, mm -hmm. I just like don't. I'm not. I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Like, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to ruin her day until she's like. Yeah. So I was just, you know, like, mm, weather's nice tonight. You know, and just, what can I say? Like, yeah. I don't, I don't want, I don't want her to have to endure one of my lectures. Like, she may, she may read my book. Yeah. I behave myself. Yeah. Uh, so, and and keeping my mouth shut last night was an example of behaving myself. Yeah. Uh, so it's it it all made sense. Like all the ketogenic principles in the physiological function. It's like we have an entire system of the body to facilitate ketogenesis. And the fact that people want to ignore an entire system of the body is like ludicrous to me. Like what, why, why would you, why would you say that, 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 
oh, that whole system is wrong. So is, is your liver wrong? You want to get that removed? Mm. Like, gotcha. what? Yeah. So, um, and of course, with the Western diet, nobody uses the ketogenic system. Yeah. It's just ignored. And so, uh, so putting all those things together, I realized that carnivore nutrition was absolutely the way to go. Um, also time restricted eating, you know, I only eat, uh, only right now I'm only eating five meals a week. Wow. Wow. And you haven't lost any muscle mass. I mean, you haven't lost any muscle mass. I mean, I know Jason Fung's research. Yeah. I'm showing growth hormone increases and you get, you know, all the hormonal releases from fasting and you've had no, cause you don't have much fat. So if you, you know, what does your body do when it's time restricted eating, you know, when you're fasting and needs to get the energy from somewhere. So what are your thoughts there? Oh, I'm still dipping in the body fat reserves. There's still some there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm beneath 9%, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, I'm not, I'm not three. Okay. You know, any, any place where my body's really going to fight me. So, and I'm getting really great results. So. Brilliant. Well, you look at Sean Baker, you look at Dr. Paul Saladino as well, coming up with all the carnivore research and eating nose to tail, you know, and the benefits and showing that you actually don't need any of the, you know, the greens that people are saying, the carbohydrates that people are saying that you, the most nutrient dense food is eating from nose to tail, eating things like liver and making sure that you all eat all the organ meat. It's going to be an interesting story, I think, uh, because I do think a lot of people are protein deficient, ability yeah. to absorb protein, ability to get the amount of protein in that they need. I think our yeah. guts are destroyed, so we're not, we're not absorbing it as much as we should. But uh, Dr. John Jackwish, uh, we're coming to the end of the show. Uh, I want to ask all my guests this last very question, and uh, is that if people want to sustain their transformation and maintain using the X3, the X3, it's not for sissies. This thing is a proper exercise machine. You yeah. want the results, yes. you're going to you're gonna have to put it in, you know. Uh, and so what would you say the key factors are to sustain any transformation that you, that you want in your body? Discipline instead of motivation. When you're disciplined, you only have one decision to make and it's this decision right in front of you. You know, and it, what kind of person do I want to, you know, when I go to sleep tonight, what kind of person do I want to think that I was today? The person who had no willpower and ate the pizza or the person who skipped the pizza and had an actual healthy meal at the proper time window, you know, so it's one decision and everybody has gone a day without food. Everybody has gone a day where they didn't eat a cake, right? So live one day without eating a cake, then you never need a cake. <laughs> You know, and you also have to really drive in your head that that is just food for diabetes. Yeah. That's what that is. Yeah. Uh, and like I said, there's a, a way to apply a very small amount of carbohydrates strategically. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just the general nutrition that you go through day by day. Uh, and, and so, like, let's say the average person who could gain... 50 pounds of muscle and make their body fat very low and look like a professional athlete, but they're very far away from that. And then might look at a picture of me and say like, Oh, you know, I'm going to look just like that guy. Or maybe, you know, like Jeremy Boyandia, who's very gifted genetics. I mean, I think the guy has like, like a 20, 27 inch waist. I mean, it's just you know, small head bones. It's like, yeah. guy, it's just proportionately like amazing. Um, yeah, I don't have that. Uh, so, um, but you know, they, they look at that and they may be 10,000 individual decisions away from that. And because that's so daunting, because it's so far away, it's easy to go, ah, oh, you know, I'll just have like a cheat day and, you know, just, you know, I'm going to a barbecue with friends and I'll see whatever I want today, but you know, tomorrow I'll, I'll get right back to it. Martin never comes because yeah. there's always a reason. There's always an excuse. Yeah. So you just need to say, the only thing you need to get through is today. Yeah. The only decision I need to make is proper nutrition today. Right. 
And that's easy. One decision. Am I, am I going to go to bed and go, I'm a loser. I screwed up. No, you're going to go, no, uh, I'm, I'm going to be victorious when I go to sleep tonight. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, discipline is more important than motivation. There's a lot of value in there. And where can people connect with you, uh, John? And where can they get the X3? Uh, you know, I made a landing page recently, drj.com. Uh, doctor spelled out uh, and the letter j.com. And you can find the link to X3 there. You can find the link uh, to my Instagram, to Facebook, everywhere. All there. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. You're a pioneer in this, uh, if you don't want to call it the fitness industry, you're not even a part of it, but you, maybe you're a part of the strength industry. You want to see people grow and stay strong, be the best that they can be. And I tell you, I haven't felt better in the last six months through lockdown than ever. I felt the strongest and fittest, had the most amount of energy. You know, three, four kgs, it's probably three and a half kgs of lean muscle mass that I've put on. It's changed my shape. It's changed my sleep. It's just, it's had a big impact gaining muscle on just my well-being. So thank you so much. Keep, uh, keep the trolls at bay because this product's amazing. We want to get it in South Africa and they're Africa. Because they're really dumb. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, stupid, angry comments. Like, okay, yeah. so you okay, go away. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't even read the comments. I just pay people to, you know. Sort of mouth, yeah. But we want X3 in South Africa and Africa, so hopefully we can uh, form some type of partnerships in pre incredible product. And uh, yeah, we wish you all the best. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me.